doing this morning well hope you had a great week let's start the week off with giving the Lord some praise if you can stand to your feet turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor he gives me joy his 
beauty in my brokenness. I have true love instead of pain. That's freedom, though you've captured me. I have joy instead of mourning. There's beauty in our brokenness. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. I have joy instead of mourning. Because you give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Yes, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. There's beauty in my brokenness. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. Give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Yes, you give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure. Knowing your heart, Lord, say I never be, I never been so free, God in your love for me. I never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. I never been so free, God in your love for me. I never been more secure, knowing your could you give me joy? Down deep in my soul, Aaron. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Cause you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Say you give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, cause you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Good morning, Grace. Good morning, you online. Family and friends online, those just visiting, we're glad to have you this morning. I'm Mark. I'm going to lead you in uh, responsive reading this morning, scriptures. We're going to be reading out of Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26. And of course, I'll start and, and uh, we'll have the congregation part of it too. Hallelujah. Galatians 5 starting at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you. We just praise you. We know that you have a, a huge investment in us. And you want us to become more than what we are. And that's why this scripture you brought to light for us this morning. So we can be more like your character daily in everything we do. And oh, it's a struggle. I know just my wife probably gets tired of my broken records sayings that, uh, you know, I got to quit coffee. You know, I had too much sugar. Just, Lord, you know. You know all of our struggles. And some are worse than that for us, Lord. And you know, you know our burdens, Lord God. And you know how weak we are in the flesh. Oh, Lord, we pour out ourselves to you today, oh God. We ask you for a fresh infilling that we might be filled with your spirit, with these nine fruits of the spirit, and just many other things that are tied into these for character, showing that who you are through us, Lord, your light shining through us, Lord. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Yes, you invested in us to the point of dying for us. So, Lord, help us to live for you in every little way, in every big way, Lord. Being faithful in word, in deed, when we're in view of people and when we're not, when we're by ourselves. You see us, O oh God. So today we're asking a new and a fresh anointing, a new and a fresh filling for all of us today, Lord God, that we can carry these fruits and shine your light shine your love and show appreciation for all your sacrifice for us wanting to be like you. In Jesus' name we ask and we pray today. Amen. Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always be you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always be you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world You're the center. Everything revolves around you, Jesus. You, the center of it all. That the center of it all. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus at the center of my life. Jesus in the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it always be you, Jesus. Jesus, cause nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do, cause Jesus, you're the center. Señor 
worship you today because you're worthy. We give you glory today because of who you are. That if you decide not to bless us another day, you'll still be worthy because of who you are. You woke us up this morning. You gave us the activity of our limbs. You made death behave. 
and you touched us with a finger of love and you allowed our few golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. So Lord, we love you today because Lord, we, we've done so much wrong. We've sinned so much and we've, we've missed the mark so much that we don't even deserve to be here. But Lord, you saw past all of our faults and you met us where we were. And so Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Ah, uh, yes. That washes us, that purifies us, that transforms us, that renews us. So that's why you are the center of it all. Because we tried everything else. We tried to put our hope in our job and it let us down. We put hope in family and friends and they all let us down. But the day we trusted you, oh, the day you, you, we trusted you, Father, every day with you has proven to be sweeter than the day before. So, Lord, we love you today. Now, Lord, as we prepare to hear a word from you, Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding that we will hear from you, that we will be changed and challenged and transformed by your word. So spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory and honor that's due your name. It's in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together and say amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Put your hands together. What a joy it is to be in this place. Well, this morning we continue our series, um, whatever. We are studying the book of Philippians. On last Sunday, we went through verses 1 through 11. We really got hung up at verse 8. And so this morning, I want to pick up where we left off on last week, beginning at verse 9 and concluding at verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And it reads like this. Uh, Y'all mute 8, mute 8. And it reads like this, verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Thank you for standing. I want to talk this morning from the subject, praying toward joy. Praying toward joy. Some of you are familiar with the story of Aaron Raston. Uh, Aaron loved adventure and living life on the edge. By the age of 27, he had climbed 49 of Colorado's major peaks, each measuring over 14,000 feet. On this particular day, he was rock climbing in Blue John Canyon in southern Utah. He was climbing off one rock when it shifted and trapped his right arm under an 800-pound boulder. For several days, Aaron was literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. He shoved the rock with his shoulder and tried to chisel it with his knife. He even attempted to horse the rock with his climbing rope and pulley. However, the rock would not budge. After five days, with water and food gone, and having drifted back and forth between depression and visions of friends and water, he made a decision. He decided to cut off his own arm. He had to break his own wrist first, and then with a cheap multi-use tool, he began cutting into his arm. With a dull blade and over an hour of cutting, Aaron finally broke free. 
after amputating his arm, he crawled through a 150-foot ravine, repelled 100, one, better yet, repelled one-handed down a 60-foot wall, and then hiked six miles. True story. When asked what was going through his mind, Aaron downplayed the entire experience and explained it away as just a matter of pragmatics. He was faced with only two choices, die or cut off his arm and live. When stuck between a rock and a hard place, Aaron chose to live. Well, most of us in here will probably never find ourselves in a situation where we have to cut off a limb in order to survive. However, all of us know what it's like to be between a rock and a hard place. And I want to submit to you today, church, that how we view the hard place determines our life experience. In the book of Philippians, there is a divine equation at play here. Circumstances plus perspective equals experience. That living above my circumstances occurs when my perspective interprets my circumstances rather than my circumstances determining my perspective. If Aaron Raston would have allowed his circumstances to determine his perspective, he would have not survived had the Apostle Paul allowed his circumstances to determine his perspective. We would not have be reading the book of Philippians or any other, the other epistles for that matter. We have this letter to the church at Philippi because Paul knew how to live above his circumstances by allowing his perspective to interpret his circumstances. The fundamental question of the book of Philippians is how can we develop the kind of perspective that transcends our circumstances? On last week, we looked at the first 11 verses of Philippians 1. Paul is in prison in Rome. Near the end of his life, indicted on a series of cr crimes against the established religion of J J Jerusalem, and against the established authority of Rome. Paul had been taken into custody and at his own request, he had been sent to Rome to be judged by the highest authority in the land, Caesar. Paul writes this letter, not from the comfort of some villa in Cairo, Egypt, but while chained to a guard 24 hours a day in a Roman prison. And although Paul did not arrive at Rome the way he wanted to, that is, free, he still managed to talk about joy. There are only four chapters in this book, as we discussed on last Sunday, 104 verses or so, but of these four chapters, Paul mentioned joy at least 16 times. Joy, not the watered-down English version of the word but joy that has its roots in the word rejoice. That the joy Paul is talking about this morning means to have a sense of appreciation. Paul is in prison. However, he has a sense of appreciation for his situation. How? Because Paul had an upward focus. On last week, we examined Paul's choice. We looked at his action and we looked at his attitude. Paul was able to have joy in prison, one, because he chose to be grateful. You and I can rise above our circumstances when we choose to be grateful. My nephew blessed me the other day. I was talking to him on the phone. He's 16 years old. His parents bought him a journal and they challenged Amari to write at least one thing on a sticky note a day that he's grateful for. Mamari is learning at an early age that a way to rise above unfavorable circumstances is to choose to be grateful. Paul chose to be grateful, one. Uh, two, he never stopped praying. Three, 
He had a confident attitude. Verses 3 through 6. It teaches us that our feelings, they always follow our focus. You and I, church, can rise above unfavorable circumstances when we have an upward focus. But also when we have an outward focus. Verses 7 and 8 teaches us that our focus, it always follows our affection. And sometimes God allows adverse circumstances to realign our affections. These opening verses of Philippians 1 reveals that Paul was able to live above his circumstances because his heart was so full of people that he didn't have room for self-pity. I'm going to get to my sermon focus in a minute, but just allow me to parenthetically pause here to say this. Self-pity is a psychological state of mind of an individual in a perceived to be adverse situation, here it is, who has not accepted it and does not have the confidence to deal with it. They could be facing real issues or it might be only um, a perception of it. In short, it's like focusing on ourselves to the exclusion of everyone else and then inviting everybody to our pity party. Paul could have hosted many a self-pity parties, and there would have been a lot of people showing up because they knew how much Paul had suffered. Anyone that knew Paul knew that he was de 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 deprived of nearly every creature comfort imaginable. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 is Paul's honest testimony of suffering that we do not want you to be ignorant brothers of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired life itself. Yes, Paul and his companions were overloaded beyond their capacity to bear it, so much so that they even despaired of life itself. Paul could have hosted a pity party, but he didn't because he realized, church, that God wanted him to rely not on ourselves, but on a God who raises the dead. Beware of the seductive sin of self-pity. It is related to pride. It poisons relationships. It prevents us from repentance. Self-pity is pity turned inward. And whenever pity turns inward, it diminishes compassion for others and it makes selflessness harder to come by. Paul was able to live above his circumstances because he had an outward focus, a heart so full of people that he didn't have room for self-pity. So the question we are presented with this morning is how can we develop an outward focus? Well, the answer is simple. Three words. Pray for others. Now, I didn't think that would excite you. I mean, we do live in a me-centered society. That if I'm going to pray at all, I'm going to first pray for God to bless me. Strengthen me. Lord, provide for me. Protect me. Deliver me and sustain me. And after you finish taking care of me, then you look after my neighbor. Because it's all about me. And I believe Jesus foreknew of our selfish proclivities. Therefore, when he taught his disciples how to pray, outlined in that model prayer, notice he didn't say, give me, forgive me, lead me, deliver me, but he said us because prayer shouldn't be all about me. In fact, nothing, church, is more definitive of true spirituality than the nature of a person's prayer life. I'm in the text. Paul is in prison. 
chained to a guard 24-7, totally dependent upon the generosity of a church some 800 miles away, yet Paul carried the members of the Philippian church in his heart. In the Old Testament period, the Hebrew high priest wore a costly shoulder garment called an ephod. It hung over his heart. And over the ephod was the breast piece, and the breast piece contained 12 precious stones set in gold with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel engraved upon them. The high priest would wear these garments whenever he performed his priestly duties, so the priest literally carried the people on his heart when he went into the holy place to pray to the Lord. In the same way, church, Paul lovingly carried the names of the Philippians on his heart. He cared for them. He longed for them. He labored in prayer for them because Paul wanted their joy to increase through spiritual growth. Because when you grow in Christ, your joy also increases in Christ. That's what we left off last week that a characteristic of Christian joy is not only that it's a shared joy, but it's an increasing joy. The church at Philippi, they were already a loving group of people. But Paul was praying that they would be more loving. They were already a people who, who, who had the right priorities, but he was praying that they would pursue those right priorities with greater devotion. They were already sincere, but he was praying that they would remain um, that way until the return of Christ Jesus. They were already fruitful Christians, bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, but he was praying that they would be more so unto the glory and praise of God. And giving that this is a letter about how to enjoy um, a prevailing and lasting joy, even in the midst of the deepest trials of life, then I take it that the things that Paul said that he was praying for them were intended to lead them to their enjoyment of a greater level of joy. In other words, the things that Paul prayed for them were prayers that led to ultimate joy in Jesus Christ. All I'm trying to tell you, church, is that spiritual growth and joy are connected. You can't have one without the other. And one of the ways we increase in joy is through prayer that glorifies God. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 teaches us four ways to pray towards joy. Number one, if you're taking notes, we ought to pray for a fuller experience of love. Pray for a fuller experience of love. Verse 9 in your Bible, Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now church, this is stunning. Notice in Paul's petition, that love doesn't have an object. He doesn't say that your love for God may abound more and more. He doesn't say that your love for one another may abound more and more. This is because Paul prayed that love would overflow up to God and out to each other in limitless abundance. Remember now, Paul was rooted in Old Testament theology. So he knew that the importance of love in one's life was established by God some 1,500 years prior. Paul knew that the two tables of the Ten Commandments were structured four, six. That is, the first four command love for God. And the last six command love for others. The first four is vertical love. The last six is horizontal love. Thus Paul is praying that the Philippians' love 
would overflow in every dimension in a lavish, ongoing, limitless love, an unremitting geyser of love up to God and a flood of love that flows to everyone else. A love that one goes beyond the boundaries and a love that too stays within the boundaries. Let me work this because you need to get it. Paul ain't praying for a shapeless, uninformed, unaware kind of love. Because the B clause of verse 9 says, in knowledge and depth of insight. Is that in your Bible? The kind of knowledge that Paul speaks of here is a kind that is acquired over time. It's, 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 it's a kind of knowledge that, that grows and, and matures through a careful interaction with, with what God says in his word. And, and, and the kind of discernment that speaks of, uh, that Paul speaks of, uh, is, is one that applies that growing knowledge to the temporal things of everyday life. The kind that understands the truth about all things that we encounter in life and understands them to be what God says them to be. Let me make it make sense. The more we know God, the more reason we have to love God. Let me say it again. The more we know God, the more reason we will have to love God. Because to know God, now, I'm not talking theoretically, something you picked up from a book or, or something your mama or daddy taught you as a child. The knowledge Paul is talking about is existential, relational, and responsive when you know God for yourself. You see, folks ain't got the prime and pump you to say amen. Somebody asked me, was it difficult? preaching to a camera in an empty building some two, two years. Honestly, no, because I learned almost 20 years ago that if don't nobody say amen, you better be your own witness. Because when theory hooks up with experience and what you've heard about God matches up with what you know about God, you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and you're coming to his courts with praise, it'll hit you at the grocery store. It'll hit you while you're at work. It'll hit you in the car because you know for yourself that the Lord has been good to you. I ought to have at least one witness this morning. But, but, but notice what, 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 what Paul says because he says a love that grows in knowledge and in insight. Now, 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 this is where it messed me up the other day because you cannot say that you know God and treat your neighbor any kind of way. Because to know God, and I mean to know God, is to know what God says about your neighbor in his word. I listen to these political commentators and some of these evangelical preachers. It ain't no way we serve in the same Jesus. It, it, because it's amazing how some of them can display ostentatiously their religion and their love for God, yet enact policies that oppress those living in the margins and refuse to pass policies that will help America make good on her promise of liberty and justice for all. You cannot say that you know God and at the same time oppress the very ones that he died for. Because love that flows vertically must also extend horizontally. Because in the words of Dr. James Forrest, nobody gets into heaven without a letter of reference from the poor. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a refugee, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? 
When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did to the least of your brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. Love that flows vertical church, it ought to extend horizontal. We ought to pray for a fuller experience of love. But there's something else we ought to pray for. Number two, if you're still with me, pray for a finer evaluation of life. Pray for a finer evaluation of life. Paul says, so that you may be able to discern what is best. We can start right there. Because the word Paul used is for discern in verse 10 or approve in some of y'all's translations means to put something through the test with a view toward approving it. It was the verb used for evaluating metals to determine their worth. The Greek word translated excellent literally means things that differ, things that pull in opposite directions. So Paul was praying that these Christians at Philippi would be able, here it is, to apply spiritual tests to the different views of life the different appeals, the different attitudes, and the different actions around them and discern which ones were best, which ones really had value. Graduates, as you embark on this new journey, my prayer for you, my sincere prayer for you as your pastor, as your spiritual covering, is that God increase your discernment. Because life is filled with difficult daily decisions. Every day we are faced with a myriad of choices, not just between good and bad. That's easy. But between good and better. And between better and best. And it's not always an easy task to decide which direction to take, which, which road to travel. The world has been likened to a shop window in which someone has shifted the price labels around. The worthless items are often marked with high price tags and the most valuable items often have cheap price tags and it's difficult church to know the true value of things anymore. And what we need more than anything else today is a sense of what is vital a sense of spiritual sensitivity to true value so that we will be able to distinguish between the good and the best. In case you don't know by now, I tell you, everybody that's with you ain't with you. That's discernment. Everything that glitters ain't gold. That's discernment. And the grass ain't always greener on the other side. And if it is, that could be because they got more manure to fertilize the soil. You need discernment in this life. You need to know what God has already marked off as essential or superlative regarding true life in Christ. Pray for a full experience of love, church. Pray for a finer evaluation of life. But number three, here it is. Pray for a fairer example of living. Pray for a fairer example of living. I'm still in verse 10. Paul says, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There are two things Paul is praying for here. Sincerity and integrity. You see, to be sincere comes from a word that means, and I love it, tested by sunshine. You see, when the ancients made porcelain vessels, the pottery would often break or crack. When that happened, they 
would mend the cracks with wax. And sometimes when you just looked at a vase, you would not know that it had been dropped and cracked or not. There was one sure way to know whether the object had been patched, and that was to hold it up to the sunlight. And the wax would immediately become visible. When the objects were not packed, that is, when they were pure, the merchants would advertise them as being in Latin, sincera, without wax. And that is where we get our English word sincere. To be sincere means to be pure enough to stand the test of sunlight. Oh, I wish I had time. But church, God wants us to live in this world in such a way that when we are held up for examination in the bright light of the sun of affliction and persecution, people can see that we the real thing. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were held up for examination in the bright sunlight of compromise. The king discovered that they were the real thing when he woke up early that next morning and discovered that although he casted three in the fiery furnace, he saw four loose and walking around. And though he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter, the only thing that burned were the ropes that held them bound. They were the real thing. When Daniel was held up for examination in the bright sunlight of persecution, the king Darius discovered that he was the real thing. When he woke up the next morning and discovered that the lions that should have devoured him became one, his pillow, and two, his mattress. Wherever this life takes you, church, let it be said that you are the real thing and that you are a man and one man of integrity. Pray for a fuller experience of love. Pray for a finer evaluation of life. Pray for a fairer example of living. And finally, number four, and I'm through, pray for a further exaltation of the Lord. Pray for a further exaltation of the Lord. That is verse 11. Paul says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of our God. I'm really tempted to stop right there. <laughs> a fuller experience of love will lead to a finer evaluation of life, which will in turn lead to a fairer example of living, which will result in a further exaltation of the Lord. How is the Lord exalted from the fruit we bear? John 15, 8 says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciple. There are three things this verse reveals about this fruit. Number one, here it is, write it down. We see the priority of a fruitful life. We see the priority of the fruitful life. Paul said, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. The righteousness of God is given to the believer by faith alone. That is a forensic righteousness. We are declared righteous and made acceptable to God through Christ. It's an alien righteousness in that it comes from outside ourselves imputation. That is, God reaches down and puts us in a position of righteousness. Now, I don't think Paul is talking about 
positional righteousness. But instead, I think he's talking about practical righteousness. That out of our position of righteousness through Jesus, the believer is called to live righteously. This is a priority. Because if you are what you say you are, a Christian, you ought to bear some fruit. Because when the believer plant his or her roots in the streams of Christ, fruit emerges. What kind of fruit? We read it earlier, Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you are rooted in Christ, your life ought to show some sign. But there's something else we see about this fruit. Not only do we see the priority of fruit, but number two, write it down, we see the power of the fruitful life. The power of the fruitful life. I'm still in verse 11. Paul says that comes through Jesus Christ. Mm. You and I can't produce this kind of fruit in and of ourselves through the flesh. I don't care how many times you attend church, don't care how much you read your Bible, you can't produce this kind of fruit in your flesh. That's what people often try to produce through religious ceremony and rituals and traditions, a kind of righteous looking fruit that they produce. But that ain't nothing but artificial fruit like a seedless watermelon. I don't care what you say, that ain't no real fruit. But the fruit that the Spirit produces, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, can only be produced through the power of Jesus Christ. You've heard of Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, on one occasion, brought back some some Arabs back to London, put them in a beautiful hotel in London, and they were absolutely floored. Uh, they were Bedouins. The only thing they had ever lived in was a tent. And the thing that fascinated them most were faucets. Because Living in a desert all of their life, water was at a premium. They had merely to turn a knob in the hotel and all the water they wanted was there. And when Lawrence packed them all up to leave and they were packing their bags, he discovered that they had taken all the faucets off of all the sinks and put them in their bags under the unbelievably uh, absurd view that if they had the faucet, they would have the water. And that's how some of you are this morning. You think that if you take the faucet, you will have the water. But unless your life is connected to the pipeline, Turning you on and off will produce absolutely nothing. The power comes from the pipeline. Jesus is the pipeline. And unless you are connected to Jesus, your life will remain dry and barren. The power to bear fruit. It comes from being connected to the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me will produce fruit, but aside from me, you can do nothing. The priority of the fruitful life. The power of the fruitful life. Number three, and I'm done, we see the purpose of the fruitful life. The purpose of the fruitful life. You guessed it, I'm still in verse 11. Paul said, to the glory and praise of God. Church, this is a doxology. Paul ends his prayer by revealing 
that there is no higher purpose in life than to glorify and praise God. That when you look at your life and if you by chance got some fruit on your branches this morning despite all the mistakes you've made, the messes you've caused and the marks you've missed, your only response is to glorify and praise God. Glory. That simply means to acknowledge God for who he is. That if God decides never to do anything else in your life, my worship won't be predicated on activity, but rather on divinity. That is our reason for who he is. And beloved, if God has to do something in your life, if God got to give you something every time for you to lift up your hands and lift up your voice to praise him, your life is headed in the wrong direction. That's infamil. That's baby Christian stuff. But when you grow in in Christ, you realize that God is worthy even if you don't get the promotion. He's worthy even if you don't get the healing. He's worthy even if the breakthrough fail to come through. He's worthy not because of what he do for me. He's worthy because of who he is. And because of who he is, all glory, honor, and praise is due his name. I'm done. So let's take it from the top. We should pray for a fuller experience of love, which will lead to a finer evaluation of life, which will lead to a fairer example of living, which will result in a further exaltation of the Lord. That when I grow in love unto an approval of the things that really count in life and live with sincerity and integrity, being filled with the fruits of righteousness and giving glory and praise to God, here it is, it will lead to a joy in Christ that perseveres through the troubles and tests and trials of this life and that will endure throughout eternity. May God teach us to pray together towards this kind of joy. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for your word this morning that we have access to this joy that the world cannot take away. That you have empowered us by your spirit mm, to experience joy that transcends circumstances. That regardless of what is going on in and around my life, I can still have joy. Mm. And it is because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that my joy is complete. Because my joy is not in anything external, but I find joy in you, glory. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, I believe someone is here and they are a Christian. They are a believer, but they don't have joy. They remember a time that they had joy, but somewhere along the way, they've lost their joy. Help them in this moment to realize that joy cannot be had outside of you. 
that in order to increase in joy, I got to also increase in spiritual growth because the two are connected. So right now, Father, I pray that you would silence the voice of the enemy and press upon their hearts, their minds, in this moment, we come against the spirit of procrastination. And we're going to make up our minds today before we leave this place, before we log off online. Whether we're going to surrender, come back to you, Lord, or remain on the outside, trying to piece life together on our own. But Lord, we don't have to deal with the latter because you died so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So those burdens we carry in here, Lord, we don't have to leave with them. But we can cast our cares on you. That unconfessed sin that's, 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 that's hindering our walk with you and our fellowship with other people. Lord, we don't have to leave here with it. We can confess it because your word declares that if we that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive it. Forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Lord, have your way in this moment. Give us the courage and the boldness to make decisions that will matter beyond this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to repeat after me. I am getting my joy back. And if that's the desire of your heart today, beloved, you can get it back by coming back to Jesus Christ. Because what I love about that vine is that everything that's in the vine, because I'm connected to it, it flows through me. Lord, have mercy. So if the vine is prosperous, because I'm connected to it, guess what? I'm going to be prosperous. That, that, that if the vine is producing fruit, joy, peace, and long-suffering, that because I'm connected to it, guess what I'm going to have? I'm going to have some joy, some long-suffering, some self-control, all because of my connection to the vine. So some of you are here and you're saying, Collins, I lost my joy and, and I want to get it back. You can get it back by coming back to the source. And that's Jesus Christ. For those of you worshiping in in person, there's a connect card in your worship guide. I want to invite you to fill that card out. For those of you online, you can um, go to our website at gracechurchal.com, click on that growth track link, and it's going to walk you through some things on what it means to be a member of grace, what it means to, um, to be a member of the kingdom of God. Um, whatever decision you need to make today, I want to implore you. I want to I want to beg you to, to, to make those decisions now while you have time. You don't have to leave this place the same. But if you just choose to come back to Christ, if you choose to surrender your life, I, I promise you things will start turning around. It'll start turning around. God says it in his word. It'll turn around and, and it'll turn around. It'll turn around. So uh, whatever decision you need to make, the door of the church is, is open. So can we just give God praise for decisions that, that are being made today? Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue in worship with our tithes and our offerings. Um, our giving options are on the screen. Uh, we have multiple ways that you can give this morning, whether you're giving in person, online, or you mail your, 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 your tithes and your offerings. Uh, whatever you give, whatever amount you give, um, we believe what the word says and that we should give it from a cheerful place because God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and so here at Grace, we declare some things over our seed because we believe that when we give to God, 
we are in partnership with him um, because if the Lord says that if I give, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour, then that means a partnership. That means I give and God pour. Now, I can't tell you how the blessing is going to manifest in your life. I'm not that close to God. God don't give me the 401 on how he's going to bless you. But I'm from the old school. Any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Anyway, it can be a good night's rest. You hear what I said? Um, it, can, it, can be, it can be a close parking spot at Walmart. You know, however you want to bless me, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to tie your hands. And so let's declare it together on three, wherever you are at home or in the person, one, two, three, as an act of faith, love, gratitude, and a heart for the house, we bring up from our house. Yes, because I am a, the fear of lack has been broken and has no power over me. Because I am a tither and a giver are open to me and God rebukes the devourer for my sake. So as we give today, we are believing you for supernatural favor, new financial discipline, excellent health, God ideas and strategies, debts paid off, blessings and increases, peace that surpasses all understanding, joy unspeakable, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. And today, I commit myself to being a part of this 100% generous giving community called Grace Community Church. Thank you, Lord. And the opportunity to give is offering time. Come on, praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for your commitment to stewardship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the exact number this week after we uh, total it up. Um, but we, we, we've just completed successfully a school term with our new initiative, our backpack program. Um, and so every Friday, um, since the school term has been in, um, your church, Grace Community Church, has been feeding students at two schools, um, Danley Elementary and Jeff Davis High School. And every single Friday, um, your church, Grace Community Church, has been feeding, I think it's, it's almost over 30 students between the two schools. Uh, now, that's a good place to, to do something. There we go. There we go. There, that, uh, there we go. Okay. We're we going to learn when to do it. I, I'm talking about your church, right? And, and, and the gifts and the tithes and offerings that, that you give, we're able to do the type of ministry that we do. And so we're going we're gonna to look at the, um, the tally on the, 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 the amount of pounds that, um, of food that we've given over this school year. And so I just want to thank um, all the ones that come out on Wednesday night. Um, Ms. Moore, Vaughn, Ms. Roxas, Chandra, Chanda. Uh, am I missing? Who am I missing? Monique, Ms. Uh, Schulte, um, Roderick, he come on Friday to deliver the bags to uh, Jeff Davis and Danily. Uh, it's, it's, it's a team, you know, it's a team, you know, that makes this stuff happen during the week. And so we, uh, we thank God for them. So can we give God praise for their participation? Amen. Yeah, them bags heavy, ain't it, Roger? <laughs> yeah, they, I told them, they cleaned, they cleaned out the pantry last, this past Wednesday, y'all. And so I had to go and, um, and deliver them. When I said they cleaned it out, they cleaned it out. And so the bags probably had about five cans of them meat in them. You know, and so I had to tote all that stuff by myself, Roderick. I had to tote it in there, Doc. I mean, I was, and it was hot Friday. I, it was hot. I it was hot. I was so glad to get in that school with an hour. <laughs> but it was a joy. It's a joy. I'm so grateful that we're able to do it um, and we're able to learn from it. And, and in, in addition to that, we've also been feeding people um, um, outside of the backpack program. Uh, families, y'all hear what? Families, you know, uh, because when people hear that you're doing something, 
you know, uh, word get out that, hey, Grace, you know, they'll hook you up with some food. Now, we may not be able to pay, you know, bills and all the different kind of stuff, but at least we can do is feed those who are hungry. And we're going to eventually get to that place, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that place where we're able to pay utilities and help out with this. But, you know, here at Grace, we believe big but start small. And so in starting small, at least we can feed those who are hungry. And so I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for where we're headed um, in the future. Amen. Amen. All right. Takai is going to come now and, um, and, and honor our, um, our graduates. Um, I, turn her up. That's three. So unmute three on that mic. Good morning, Grace. Good morning, Grace. I am so excited to be able to honor our 2022 graduates. What makes this so exciting is, as I was going through the names, I promise you, I taught all these children, young adults now, in children's church. And to see them come full circle, it is so awesome and such a blessing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to call your name, and if you are here, I want you to come to the front, okay? If um, the graduate is not here and a family member is here, I want you to come to the front and stand in their stead. And I know some of them could not make it today, so they're watching online, but if you are here, we want you to come to the front because we want to bless you and we want to pray over you, okay? Amen. So um, first, we're gonna, we are going to honor our pre-K graduates, which is class of 2035, okay? Our pre-K graduates, first up, we have Miss Paris Johnson. There she is. There she is. Paris um, graduated from McKee Pre-K Center, and she will be attending McMillan International Academy to go to kindergarten. Congratulations, Paris. Come on, you can turn around. You can turn around right here, baby. And Pastor Collins has something for her. So Grace has gifted Paris with a Bible 365-day um, devotional. And the reason we wanted to give Paris that, even though it's for children and on her age, at for her age, it is important to start the practice of spending time with God every day. Right? So we're going to go ahead and begin to instill that in Miss Paris now. So later on, she will know how to go to God in prayer on her own. Amen. Now we're going to go to Grace High School graduates, class of 2022. First up, we have Jonathan Jackson. Jonathan graduated from Stanhope Elmore High School. He is a member of four honor societies and multiple community service organizations. Jonathan was admitted and offered scholarships from five plus universities. He will be attending Auburn University in the fall of 2022, majoring in supply chain management. Let's give it up for Jonathan. Next, we have Madison McClendon. Madison graduated from Stanhope Elmore High School. She is a member of the National Beta Club, Theater Award winner, and National Society of Honor School High School Scholars. Madison will be attending the University of Alabama in the fall of 2022, majoring in communications. She desires to pursue a career in communications and journalism. Next, we have Brother Sterling Milford. Where he at? Sterling Milford. That's his mom. Now, Sterling is the one who do the slides every Sunday, y'all. So y'all may not see him, but he's normally in the back. Sterling graduated from Stanhope Elmore High School. He is the 2022 recipient of the Coca-Cola Work Heart Scholarship. 
Sterling will be attending Central Alabama Community College, majoring in computer information systems. He desires to pursue a career in the reward career in IT in the IT world. Amen. Next we have a uh, Clinton Ryan. Clinton Ryan. Clinton graduated from George Washington Carver High School. Clinton graduated number eight in his class. He is a recipient of honor cords for National Honor Society, a member of the Drama Club and Youth in Government. As a four-year participant in Youth in Government, he was selected as an alternate to the 2022 Conference on National Affairs to be held in July of 2022 at the YMCA Blue Ridge Assembly in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Clinton will be attending Full Sail University in Winter Park, Florida, majoring in computer animations or gaming science beginning fall of 2022. Clinton was awarded a Full Sail Creative Mind Scholarship in the amount of $22,000. The Full Sail Creative Mind Scholarship is designed to help passionate 2022 high school graduates develop into successful entertainment, media, art, and business professionals. Clinton is still awaiting the amounts and results of various other scholarships that he has been informed he will be awarded. Next, we have Ms. Kane Stewart. I know she's watching. <laughs> Kane graduated from Stanhope Elmore High School. She is the daughter of King and Sonia Stewart. Kane plans to continue to work at the Alabama Parent Education Center, and she will continue to bowl and practice for the Special Olympics. Kane will continue to thrive for people to look at her abilities and not her disability. And for those of you who don't know, Kane can bowl like for real, for real. <laughs> She's a beast in bowling. Next we have Haley Ziegler. Haley graduated from Stanhope Elmore High School. She was nominated for the National Technical Honor Society. Haley has been accepted into four colleges and has received over $14,000 in scholarships. Haley plans on going to the Air Force to become a pediatric nurse. Amen. And so Grace has gifted our high school graduates with Bibles and a book that says prayers that availeth much. The reason we gave our high school graduates that one, we need the Bible, right? To learn how to go to the word of God for all of our needs and everything that we're dealing with. And so now you guys are embarking upon adulthood and new seasons. And what a time to learn how to go to the word of God for all of your needs. And then the prayers that avail us much, I promise you it has a prayer for every single thing you can imagine. So going to God in prayer and just reading those prayers as we walk into that next season of life. Next, we have Grace College graduates, class of 2022. First up, we have Kendall Hearn. Kendall graduated from Troy University with her bachelor's in fine arts. All four years, she was magna cum laude. Kendall received a scholarship from Troy to travel to Italy for two weeks in the summer to attend DAP Festival. This is a dance festival that dancers from around the world attend. Kendall will continue to dance and choreograph while going to physical therapy school. She desires to be a physical therapist assistant with specialization in sports medicine while still teaching and choreographing dance. Next up, we have Nicole Jackson. Nicole graduated from Troy University with a BS in exercise science. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, and Nicole plans to work this summer. Next, we have Grace Military Graduates, class of 2022. We have Delaya Crawford. 
Delaya is a graduate from Air Force Guard basic training. Her next step, which I think she's already there, is advanced individual training at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Amen. And so to our college graduates, we gifted them with a devotional um, that really will take their relationship with God to the next level, as well as a journal on self-care, because now they're really walking in adulthood. And it's time to just learn not only how to spend time with God, but how to have time for yourself. And so those are the gifts that we have for them. And if you're watching online, get with me so we can make sure that we can give you your gifts, okay? So before I take my seat, I do want to pray over the graduates. Um, as you guys are walking into a new season, that is always a blessing when you are leaving one thing and transitioning to another thing. Amen. And so in that transition, sometimes things can be a little rocky, but we're going to pray for smooth transitions in the name of Jesus, right? So everyone who's in the crowd, I just want you to point your hand to our graduates and intercede with me as we go to the Lord and prayer for them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you with praise and thanksgiving. God, we worship and adore you just for who you are. We thank you for our graduates. We thank you for who they are and for who you called them to be. We thank you for their assignment on this earth. We thank you for their destiny. We thank you for their purpose. God, we thank you for the new season that they are about to walk into. Holy Spirit, we ask that everything they touch, God, will be blessed. God, we thank you for favor that goes beyond anything that they can see. God, favor with teachers, favor with professors, favor with lenders, favor with classmates, favor with colleagues. God, favor on job interviews. God, we just ask that you will overwhelm them with favor. Then when people see them and when people encounter them, they know that they are talking to king's kids, kids who are blessed, kids who are anointed. God, to walk into this world and represent you like never before. So, God, we ask that you will go before them, that you will be behind them, and that you will camp your ministering warring angels around about them in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for their assignments here on this earth. God, we ask that you would make every crooked place straight. God, that you align their steps and order their steps in the name of Jesus. For all these things, we pray and give you glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give our parents and our graduates another hand? Amen. Amen. All right. Are everybody standing. We're getting ready to leave this place. Uh, make sure you tune in this week uh, for virtual Bible study as we continue in um, yeah, the, the, the prayer of Jabez, uh, First Chronicles chapter uh, 4, uh, verses um, 9 and 10. We're going to continue in that on this week, so make sure you tune in um, this Friday for that. Also, just be, um, you know, we're going to be walking through the book of Philippians over the next several weeks, and so uh, right now we're in chapter 1, so I want to encourage you to go ahead on and just read through chapter 1. Um, and read through chapter two. It's just four chapters, and so we're gonna it's gonna take all summer for us. I'm just in chapter one, uh, the first eleven verses. So yeah, we got some time, you know. So we're gonna walk through it together as a church. So go ahead on and and just uh, walk through it, you know, in your devotion and uh, ask the Lord to light up your understanding. Amen. Amen. All right, we're getting ready to leave, but I want to bless you. Just raise your hand as high as you see yourself going this year and receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace in your going out and your coming in, in your lying down and your rising, in your working, in your leisure, in your laughter, and in your tears. And now may the favor of God open up doors beyond your education put you in front of people beyond your training and now may the hand of God drop you in the middle of the best days of your life. God is doing a wonderful and an unheard of thing. So expect it. Receive it. Thank God now for it because greater is here. In Jesus name shout hallelujah and amen. Amen. Make sure y'all eat up all the refreshments in that lobby. I don't want to have none left over. 